All right, so this is going to be the little set of videos where I show basically everything that I go through or do whenever I go on an image. So first, we're going to get uh, sort of sample shots for the framing of our image. So this is Telescopius. Uh, we're going to be looking at the um, at NGC 2467, right nebula. Uh, it looks like this. We're in a pretty good time, though it's not super high in the sky. Um, so we get our framing that we want. This looks fine. It's around the right direction and everything. Magnitude's good and everything. Um, and then we snip this image with snipping tool. Like so. And then you'll save this to wherever exactly. Um, we're, we're doing this in order to make sure that we um, have the framing for when we're actually looking at the image to make sure we're actually on target because a magnitude 7 for example is not necessarily going to show up in a single exposure at least not one that uh, not one that like the length that I'm doing so I normally take 20 seconds so this is probably not going to show up but you will be able to see all these little stars to make sure that you have everything in frame uh, the next thing we're going to be looking at is the seagull nebula nebula a little bit higher, pretty good time again. So we're gonna rotate the frame a little bit to make sure we get everything in there. Something sort of like that. So we'll use like the star, the star, these two or so. Uh, just a bunch of them around the edges to make sure our framing is good for everything. Uh, and then once again, take a snip and move it over to a device that you're gonna have with you so that you can check the framing while you're out on site. Um, you may not be using other software, so if you're not, it also has right ascension and declination, which are really important for precise go-to, which will appear later in the video. But yep, that's the first step. So next should be our collimation testing. All right, so next step is making sure that our collimation is good. We're gonna collimate it before we leave, and then once we get on site, we're gonna make sure that the collimation's still good. So again, we normally use, for this scope at least, our 2 to 1.25 inch adapter with a 1.25 inch head and the laser collimator. So we just screw these in. This You should already be familiar with collimation, so I'm not going to go over everything here. But pop that off, lock that in, turn that on, looks good, let's shut this off, better visibility. That looks fine right there. And then we're going to come over here and make sure that the laser is centered. Looks like it is. Looks pretty good. Pop this back on. Come back over here. Make sure that the, uh, the dot is centered. It should be in the center of that, uh, that hole where it's actually coming from. So that looks pretty good. So we don't have any issues with collimation right now. So we will check it again when we're out there, but until then we're gonna pack up and get going. All right, so a few things that are pretty important to pack before you go out. Make sure that you're gonna have enough equipment and everything to stay warm. So I've got multiple shirts on, a pretty big jacket, uh, gloves, just a bunch of layers generally, since it's gonna be 40 to 30. The, the colder it is outside, the less noise your camera will have. So the colder the better, but as long as you can handle it and don't get uh, frost and fog and whatnot going on. But uh, yeah, make sure you've got all your stuff. Make sure you're, you're not gonna be bored if you're going out somewhere and don't have a, like I sometimes don't have internet, which is a bummer, but I download a bunch of stuff to make sure I'm good. And if if you're going anywhere, make sure that you don't forget anything. I've forgotten batteries once, and that was not a good experience. So just get everything together. Make sure you're good. Give yourself plenty of time to get out there, because um, you know, moon permitting and conditions permitting for clouds and whatnot, uh, you want to make sure you have a good amount of time to set up. So yeah. All right. So make sure you take care of your telescope on the way over there too. Not just for like conditions' sake, but uh, to also make sure that your collimation doesn't get messed up. So I don't have a case, but I sort of wrap it in a, in a blanket. And generally that's been good enough for me. Just make sure you don't drive too, uh, too rough, I guess. And uh, yeah.
All right, so fortunately for you guys, we got out here before it's dark. This doesn't normally happen. Normally I get out here when it's dark, but now you can kind of see at least a little bit better how we set up the scope. So I've got my box of all the stuff that we have right here. If you have any feet pads, the anti-vibration pads, you want to drop them underneath each of the individual feet in your scope, of course. These, uh, these help a little bit. Uh, I haven't figured out exactly how good they are at vibration stopping, but uh, it does kind of help on this grass, giving us a good spot. Oh yeah, so by the way, this is public property. We're right next to a boat ramp right there. Uh, so you may, we want to make sure that if you're going out, you're not going to get on anyone's private property because not going to be good if something happens that way. So now that we've got the feet on for everything, we're going to look at the bubble level. So right here, I've got a few lanterns to help see some of this stuff. So bubble level is a little bit off. Let me position you so that you can see this a little bit better while I'm adjusting. All right, so since we're a little bit off, we're gonna adjust the legs. So we're bringing this side down just a little bit. Maybe right there. And then come over to this other side and bring this up a little bit. Up a little bit. Go right there. And then get this one last side. Hopefully the light doesn't fall down on me. This might happen right here. I called that. Well, anyways, that looks pretty good. I think that's good enough for our purposes. You want to do as good as you can for that, but that works. All right, so next we are probably going to wait just a little bit because stars aren't out too much yet. That is the moon up there. It's a little bit after the new moon, uh, so that moon is actually setting right now. But shouldn't be up for too long. It's going to be up for the first thing we're imaging, but not the second. And then the dot next to it, I believe, is Mars. Uh, but be able to tell that in a minute when we open up Stellarium, which is one of our phone apps. Uh, over there is Cirrus. And you can just see some of the brighter stars right now. But we're going to wait for just a little bit longer before we actually align our telescope. In the meantime, however, one thing that we can definitely do is check our collimation again. So, like before, we come over, back over here. Pop our collimator in, turn it on, a little red laser. Pop that in just like that. Make sure it's nice and tight. We can look down the barrel. Make sure it's smack dab in the center of the telescope, which it is. It's kind of hard. Oh, and yep, there you can kind of see it. And since that's good, we look at the collimator itself. So, yep, collimation looks pretty good. Nothing really moved in the car. So we're off to a good start. So next step is power and alignment. All right, it's getting darker on us relatively quickly, which is good. So first thing as a precursor, we're gonna take our camera. This is my Canon EOS 4, uh, 450, um, yeah, 450D is what it was. Um, get our T-ring and our, ooh, our uh, 2 to 1.25 inch adapter that we used for the collimator. Tighten this on. Pop 
pop this on to the front of our camera, of course. Yep, till it clicks. We're good. Come over here. Pop it in. Oh, you're not going to be able to see this at all, are you? Yep, so we got that right there. Yep, and pop that in. Same way we did their collimator. Just like that. Tighten up our screws a little bit. And ta-da. So one thing that we are gonna do before we actually align align the scope, but after we power it on, is we're actually going to check the focus. Now, I know for my telescope right now, the focus should be pretty good, but never hurts to check it. And I've messed up a great time on Orion because my focus was a little bit off. So this is something that you should check. So we're gonna get our power going, turn that on. Plug this in to our telescope. I'm gonna get another lantern going real quick. Definitely don't really, ooh, that's bright. Definitely don't really need any of the lantern stuff, but it, uh, it helps you all see, so. It's definitely a plus. Plug that into our little port right there for our power beneath the hand control. Flip this guy on. Red lights, very good. Okay, so now we can move it around and everything. So we're gonna go to something really bright so very convenient and really bright. That planet right there. And check our focus. So we're gonna use our red dot sight right there. Hopefully I can get the red dot to show up in the camera. Oh, there we go, yep. Just like that. And then here's why we turned our, or put our camera on the telescope a little bit early. So we're gonna get our settings good. And one of the good things that this camera has is live view. So we're gonna hit set. It gives us a little live view. And this live view will help us make sure that this is in focus. So we got five times view, 10 times. That looks pretty good. Generally the diffraction spikes will uh, sort of split, I guess. Like you can, you can barely see a little bit of it on parts of the spikes at any given moment. But generally if you're really out of focus, you can tell, this, it'll be like a big blob and your spikes won't be four, they'll be They'll kind of come out in pairs, which makes it look really weird. So focus is good. If we didn't have good focus, we would undo that top knob and work our focuser to make sure we're in a good spot. It's kind of difficult on the scope, uh, just because it doesn't weigh a huge amount. So uh, good luck with that if, if something goes wrong in that regard. But now that that's good, we're gonna move on to our alignment. All right, so hopefully, hopefully you don't mind the video quality dropping a little bit, but I gotta use my phone now for actual uh, apps and stuff instead. So this is my old phone, but no, like, the phone recording is my old phone, but we need to look at some good stars to do our alignment off of. So this is Stellarium. It's a really good app. You can actually go change the time, look at everything. You can set uh, it to show your deep sky objects or not. Um, and there's this really helpful mode here in the menu. You hit this, and it sort of gives you 
a live look at all around you to help make sure that you can identify what stars there are. So the object that we're going to be looking at is it? Oh, let's check that real quick. It's Venus. It is not Mars. It is Venus. So we are going to be looking at NGC 2467 first right there. So generally when you're doing alignment, uh, you have you have a few options. There's skyline, there's two star line, and there's auto two star line. So skyline is real nice if you don't know the names of the stars. It can help do that for you. You just pick three and it figures out which ones there are. But in order to get real good imaging, you want to or at least get real good imaging on a altazimuth scope like I have, you want to switch directions as little as possible. So I do two star, and since our object is right here, we want to pick something kind of opposite to it. So let's see, that was in the south, pretty southeast. So we're going to look northwest. We might use alpha rats, for example, or sheet, sheet like that. So we're going to do something like that and then flip around to say uh, maybe Alpharad. Alpharad looks really good right here. So let's get to that real quick. First thing I want to show about the actual alignment process uh, is you hit enter you get to pick between which align you want. So we're doing two star. Oh, camera's oh, there we go. Two star align. But once you hit that, once you hit enter for that, you want to hit back and make sure that your longitude and latitude are good. Now, Stellarium helps with this again because you can go to your menu, hit these three bars again, and do location. And it'll give you your longitude and latitude coordinates. So making sure those are good. That looks good for me. Yep, west is correct. Uh, and then latitude 32. Yep, that looks good. North, everything is good. We get our time right there, current time, which is going to be 1855. Four, six standard time central and our date o two two seven two oh two oh good and then it tells us to pick which star we want so the star that we talked about earlier for our first thing was Alpharaz. So you want to make sure that that's in the menu. So it's alphabetical. Alpharaz. P H. Alpharaz, right there. And you want to hit enter and center your scope on it. So we're going to do that in just a second. Uh, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna fill this part. It's a little bit too dark. All right, so it's really hard to see on here, but oh, there it is. For a second, you can see the star that we're centering on in frame. We're gonna bring it to the center. Use our five and ten times zoom on our camera to make sure that that is directly in the center. And remember, if we're going up, if our target is going to be going up and right, we want to be going up and right. That way, your gears don't uh, don't suffer the backlash of changing directions. So we're going to get that right there. Five is good. Now ten. Ten's a little bit off center and ten, but you can actually see it moving in the frame as we speak. So right there is good now. So we're going to hit center, enter for center, 
on this is what it prompts you to do, and then align. And then we're going to pick a second star, which we chose Alpharaz, I believe. So I'm going to get that slewed and back on just a second. Yep. So Alphard, we hit enter, and then we're going to slew all the way to it. So again, we want to make sure that if our object is going right and up, then we want to go right and up. And since the, the thing that I'm looking at is going to be in the south and it's rising and going to the right, that's exactly what we want to do. So we're just going to let the telescope slew all the way around to it. All right, so once again, we are on target. Get this to focus. Yep, yep. Come on. Yeah, you can see it right there. We're going up and to the right. Gentle. Make sure we use our zoom. 10 times zoom right now. Up and to the right. Make sure it's centered in frame. Enter, align. One moment, star pointer success. All right, so now that we've got that done, we want to go into the menu, hit menu, seven. I keep flipping this around. Menu, and then we want to go to, not that way, but precise go to. And then it'll ask you database or right ascension and declination. We want to do right ascension and declination and then you enter the location of the object that you want to track. So you can do this through Stellarium using the information there, or you can use Telescopius, the images that we saved earlier. So I'm gonna quit out and do that real quick. All right, so once we got that done, it's gonna tell us stars that are nearby the target. And it's gonna slew to that, and then it's gonna ask us to center it, and then it'll slew to the actual thing. So. This star that we're slewing to, I'm going to pick Wesson because I believe that's uh, on the way towards the target. So we're going to do that. And this test star, or alignment, additional alignment star, so to speak, is a great way to tell how good your alignment was prior. So if it's not even in frame, then you probably want to redo it. But if it's there and it's not too far off, then you're probably okay. So, oh. That looks real good. It is actually in view of our 10 times zoom. That is fantastic. So we're just gonna center that like it asks, center. And now we're slewing to our target. Oh, looks like I did uh, overshoot a little bit. Looks like Wesson was on the other side, but that should be okay. So now we'll get out our other stuff, our remote camera shutter, and uh, check on how framing is. Okay, so that slew went spectacularly well, actually. It's really hard to see since this camera doesn't have very good uh, dynamic range, but you can just barely see this big eye in the thing. And it's about offset like that in the camera, so I do need to rotate my uh, camera just a little bit to make sure that we're getting the framing that we want, but that's real good I can see these three stars that one that one that one and I can actually see the core of this Thing just a little bit All right, so we did fine-tune the positioning just a little bit and it's important that you guys know that whenever you're adjusting it mid uh, mid shot I guess if you're not going in the same direction that the item is going the object rather then you're going to see the backlash. It might take a few seconds. It, it's probably not going to be the first image for the, um, for the telescope to overcome the backlash that it suffered during the um, adjustment. So this camera, I can see it way better. There, the focus is not really working with me right now. Oh, there we go. So there's three stars of the ones that we talked about. That framing looks pretty good. So we're going to let it start going. Just toggle on that shutter and let it go. Uh, some last final little notes here. Make sure you turn off your, uh, your finder scope. You can run the battery down on that. I've forgotten to turn it off tons and tons of times. Uh, and then also 
make sure if the moon is up, that's the moon right there, not focused at all, but if the moon is up, you don't want to try and image anything really close to it. You want to make sure that the object that you're trying to shoot is a good ways away, at least 90 degrees. Um, it doesn't matter as much if the moon isn't very full. Uh, so this is it's just a little crescent right now, but uh, just keep that in mind. All right, and then here, um, so since we're doing an old azimuth mount, you need to check for field rotation every now and then. Um, generally, a good rule is consider rotating it every uh, maybe 15 minutes or so by just a smidge. Looks like uh, looks like we're doing alright so far. You can tell the tracking is going pretty good too. But uh, yeah, be uh, be aware of that. Field rotation is something unique to alt azimuth mounts that you do need to account for. Uh, right now, there's nothing, so we're gonna let it keep going. But we will have to adjust for that for sure later. So yep. Yeah. All right. So we spent a pretty good amount of time imaging, but we still have few things left to do. So we're going to turn off our scope and everything. And we need to take our dark and bias frames for this session. Uh, you don't always need to take them, but uh, you, you should have bias and dark frames, at least the dark frames, for situations with well, for sessions, rather, with similar temperatures. So, what we are going to do for that, first off, um, you normally would just add your cap to your telescope, but since I also kind of want to pack up since it's kind of cold, I'm going to take the camera off and just use the camera cap on the camera instead. That way I can pack the telescope while I'm doing this stuff. So we're just gonna leave same settings as everything. So we're gonna take the adapter off right here and set our camera cap on there. So it is completely dark. So these darks are there to get the noise, of course and just set it going. Um, so generally, I would say a good rule is I take approximately five hour sessions, something like that, five hours of shooting. And for those five hours of shooting, I generally take 15 to 30 minutes of dark frames and then maybe 30 to 40 bias frames. So I've stopped just a little bit early. So we're going to let the camera uh, take probably, probably 20, 20 something minutes of bias frames while we pack up our stuff and get ready to head out. It is pretty cold and I'm ready to get back home. So once we're done with our bias frames, we change the exposure time down to the shortest thing that it can go to, which for this should be one four thousand, and take a bunch of frames there. And this should give us an idea, or it should give the programs an idea rather, of the um, inherent pattern on the camera sensor. So we take a bunch of these. All right, and uh, last thing, of course, make sure you've got everything. And if you're out sort of in the countryside or just wherever you are, um, be careful for wild animals. 
if they they're out there because um, it's pretty late and you might encounter some like I've seen some deer run across the street right in front of me before so just be mindful of that and uh, safe drive all right so back from shooting got uh, about nine gigs or so worth of images so we're gonna pull up deep sky stacker hit open our picture files it should be on the desktop for new folder 2. We're going to open up our lights for the ones. Open up everything, hit and check all. Let's make sure we're using all of our frames. We're going to use the darks that we shot. Use the bias ones that we shot. Okay, register check pictures. Uh, I normally have this at 90%, so we have a little bit more time. You want this basically as low as possible, which we should have a really high star count. Real high star count, that's good. Okay, so stacking should be pretty good there. Um, generally, you go through here and just check off all the good stuff, like, uh, like normal. Uh, stacking parameters. Normally I do mosaic if I have the space for it, we'll see. Uh, as big of a drizzle as you possibly can, but it takes a lot of space, so we'll figure that out. Uh, where is the, we want to make it on F, F folder. So F is a spare SSD that I have. So, um, that matters quite a bit. You want your, uh, you want an SSD with the space if you have it available, because it, it makes it just so much faster. So, all that looks good. And we start it. So, this is going to take uh, a couple hours, at least with my PC. Um, if you have a... It doesn't really take any GPU, as far as I know, because it's all CPU, but um, if you don't have a SSD or a strong CPU, then it's going to take a, a long time. So we'll restart the video whenever we get there. All right, so it's the next day, and everything is done processing. This is what we got. It gives you our curves and everything, so we're going to expand these out a bit. Hit apply. We want to expand these basically as much as we can without getting too much buildup over here. Um, that's probably okay. Right there. And then we move them back a little bit on the curve. Yeah, right there. There's a lot of red. That's actually pretty good here because that helps us know that we got the really red object. <laughs> so hopefully the white balance and everything is still fine. But yeah. Let's up the darkness on here just a little bit. Boost that saturation, yeah, to 20. Apply again. Yeah, red may be a little too strong here. <laughs> it's really, really red. Just move these out a little bit. Unlink them. Pull the red back in a little bit. that looks it looks quite a bit better it looks like, looks like we're maybe going to get a little bit of vignetting there's a lot of stars in this region for sure yeah we're going to get some vignetting there's a ton of stars, look at that 
And with the editing that we're doing on Deep Sky Stacker, we uh, we don't necessarily need it to be super uh, super good yet because we're going to drop it into another post processing software. So we'll just get it to something around what we're looking for. Has a lot of stars. Yeah, that's okay enough for our purposes for this. We're gonna save picture to file. Just get it to uh, DC seven, and then I normally add the time, so it's about two hours four minutes. And then once this gets done, we head over to our next program. All right, so we've opened up our image on uh, on Raw Therapy, which is the free software that I use. Um, so first thing that we want to try and fix is the vignetting. So we come down here to our vignette filter and try and get that a little bit better because there's some uneven lighting across the field. That's probably okay. There's the depth of the blacks in here. <coughs> We probably don't want to um, up the contrast too much. Um, you'll find that in images that where you do have a good amount of noise, it it really messes with the I don't know the quality I guess optical quality. So normally I stay up around here doing a bunch of stuff there. Um, shadows and highlights. Normally I just drop all the highlights on here. Yeah, because a, a bunch of the time you'll have things that are just kind of blown out, like your stars. Um, normally don't really touch shadows. Tone mapping is one that sometimes is good. Uh, but you can go really, really overboard with it. Like, if we do this, we're just going to have like a white, yeah, it's like a white frame. We can't really see anything because all those are stars, but you can't see the nebula at all. So... We're gonna we're gonna try and keep this kind of low. Don't wanna go too far with it though. Edge stopping is another thing you can adjust for this. Um, and then the next thing we normally go to is here. Uh, I like to bump local contrast, though mostly for the dark. Uh, the darkness ones, because if you do it on the light, then it makes your stars a little bit bright for the image. And you're trying to look at the nebula in this case, as opposed to the stars, so. Get a little bit of contrast. Uh, I normally don't mess with anything that has iterations on it, because this, uh, with the size of the files, the program has a tendency to crash. <laughs> so it's not very good in that. But it's free. Um, impulse noise reduction. Um, you kind of want to mess with noise reduction, but at the same time, that can really easily make your 
finer details go away. Uh, there's the eye. Okay. This one didn't turn out to be super exciting, but that's all right. So let's go back to our shadows and darks. There's just so many stars in the field, my god. <laughs> I think we're gonna end up with something like that. I normally go in to save a ton of different versions of the image and then sort of just pick between the, the ones that I like the most. But that's the basic process that we're going for. So yeah, good luck guys.